So, um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, sorry, I cannot see you in person. Um, first of all, let me thank the organizers for, for, for organizing this nice and interesting school. I'll do my best to give a nice contribution. I hope I manage. Um, the course uh, I'm planning to give is an introductory course on double and exceptional field theory. Uh, what that means, first of all, is that some of the people I see among the participants are actually already experts in the field. That's, I'm afraid, not for you. Um, um, I hope you can sit back and relax if you are still planning to follow. And the idea is to keep things somehow down to earth as much as possible. Uh, let me first stress that there are some, a draft of some lectures no, lecture notes on Slack. The idea that it should be covering at least all of today. So this morning and this afternoon, uh, hopefully a little bit, but not too much of the Wednesday lecture too. So what are the prereqs here? The idea is to keep them as basic as possible. I expect that most of you or all of you have had I'm assuming I'm talking to PhD students here, some introduction to string theory. We won't be using that directly. We never really look at the worksheet, but yeah, that's an important motivation for obvious reasons. GR plus matter. That you all know how to use form notation. Uh, a little bit of group theory, things like uh, Lee, general Lee groups, orthogonal groups, representation theory, something about non semi simple groups, like the Poincaré group, at least. Uh, not much else. Uh, will be very useful if you have a notion of how string theories is related to supergravity. Uh, but I'll try to start as from the very beginning as much as possible. So um, before I actually start, um, I'll do my best to see questions if you raise your hand. Um, if I don't notice a question, uh, please feel free to interrupt me or, or ask uh, the people who are there to, to interrupt me for you. Uh, and generally just, uh, since I cannot even see your faces right now, I have no way to know whether you are confused or bored. So, Please share your feedback whenever you can, including on Slack, if you prefer. I won't be looking at Slack during the lecture, but I will later. Okay, so let's start with a little bit of intro. So what's the point of the course? Well, the basic idea here is if we want to summarize it and demystify it as much as possible, what we'll do will look like a rewriting of 11D supergravity or type 2B supergravity or perhaps just N equal 1 supergravity or even just the Novich Schwarz, Novich Schwarz sector of a type 2 supergravity. So you see some 11 or 10 dimensional supergravity theory or a piece of it in a form uh, that is Covariant, and we will have to specify what we mean by that. Uh, with respect to certain groups, ODD or EN. Uh, why these groups? Well, because these groups show up in string theory. They show up in string theory, at least their discrete versions, as dualities among different string theories or M theory. Um, and they also show up in supergravity. And in fact, it will be easier to make contact with how they show up in supergravity. So the one liner will be, we want to try to understand this kind of dualities in target space. And I will say through super. Now, this is not an introductory course on supergravity. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to focus on 
the bosonic field content only. So we'll never see a supersymmetry transformation throughout the course. Uh, that's a compromise to make to keep things uh, as short as possible. Um, so very good. Um, the next thing I should say perhaps is the following. So how do we, what, what's the point of this? Assuming maybe we're not yet familiar with all of this. Uh, well, I'm sure you all saw drawings of duality webs between type two, type one, heterotic, uh, and theory uh, drawn everywhere on books and, and the web. I'm not going to reproduce that, it seems too, too silly and obvious. But the point here is that we know of certain types of dualities that show up in string theory. Some of these are easy to see in the worksheet, like t-duality. Some of these may be visible in F-theory or even just in supergravity. In general, really, the tool, especially at the beginning, the first tool that was somehow going to inspire the idea of all these dualities between string theory are supergravity. Well, let me write Sugra throughout the course to save some ink. Supergravity theories, and what happens to supergravity theories when we do a kaluza klein reduction? So there are two things to say here. Um, why kaluza klein reductions? What do they have to do with dualities? And what these duality groups are? And how do they show up in supergraph? So let's start from the second one. If you start with 11D supergravity, um, we'll review that later if you're not familiar with it. Suppose I reduce on a circle, this gives me masses type 2A supergravity, which has a global symmetry associated with a shift of the Lilaton and some rescaling of the other fields. I'll be always uh, at the two derivative level, uh, there are lectures on higher derivative corrections from uh, Eric Lescano, uh, I think, starting tomorrow. Uh, everything I say is, is, is two derivatives. But then you can keep going and you reduce on circles, that's S1, definitely not S2, and you get larger and larger global symmetries. And you gain these symmetries because you're dropping degrees of freedom. You're dropping all the kind of the Klein towers along the internal circles. And you might feel, I already know these groups, but just in case, let's write all of them. This is too long. And then let's just write EN starting from there so that it fits. So we have 90, 8D, 7D. You'll get a nice table in the lecture notes and in many other places. Uh, in the literature, and that's five six uh, five four three two one zero d. You get some en group starting from e six from five dimensions. Um, but you also have type two b supergravity in ten dimensions, which has an SF two symmetry. And when you reduce to nine dimensions, you go back to the same theory you get from type two a which I mean itself is a, rep, is a manifestation of T-duality, okay? Between type 2A and type 2B. So the idea here is we get these symmetries in supergravity upon dropping degrees of freedom, by performing kaluza klein reductions. Uh, why is that? Well, let's rather to imagine if we first think of T-duality. Uh, T-duality exchanges, let's put it really as naively as possible. T-duality exchanges momentum and winding on the worksheet, right? Uh, how do we construct our supergravity effective action out of, of string theory? Well, the first thing we do is we focus on the momentum states and we drop the winding ones, even if we are on a torus. So as a result of that, uh, you can imagine that since T-duality exchanges momentum and winding, momentum and winding sit in one representation of T-duality, you drop half of that representation, 
you manifest to break to duality. So supergravity cannot possibly be T duality invariant by itself. When we do a Kaluza Klein reduction, we also drop some momentum. So suddenly we've dropped both the winding and the momentum at the same time. Hence, we drop the whole representation of T duality. As long as our field content can be written in T duality covariant form, we have restored T duality. And that's what happens under Kaluza Klein reductions. A similar thing happens for S or U dualities. You can think of U duality as exchanging momentum along an internal torus with not only winding, but also some brain wrappings. So imagine having a brain, a brain solution in supergravity, some half BPS brain uh, that looks like a particle in the external space time. Uh, the charges of this brain are going to sit in some EDD representation. I'm going to call all these series of duality groups EN, even if the first few are not exceptional. Um, they sit in the same representation. They are mixed with internal momenta, like PP waves along the internal space. Uh, as a result, again, supergravity only carries degrees of freedom associated with momenta, not with brain wrappings. They are not dynamical degrees of freedom in supergravity. They only show up as solid ones. Uh, and hence, these nice duality groups are broken explicitly in supergravity until you do a Kaluza Klein reduction. Having said all of that, what's the point of double field theory and exceptional field theory? Well, the idea here is, in fact, let me first perhaps write something down. In fact, these groups here play a role before any Kaluza Klein reduction. But they're not symmetries. I think, I hope I convinced you of that. What they do is, well, they do two things. I need a little bit more space, sorry about that. One, they organize the field content. and gauge symmetries. So you can reorganize all your field content in a way that fits uh, the action of some exceptional group or ODD group. Once you do that, you actually find that you unify and geometrize these gauge symmetries. If you heard of generalized geometry or exceptional generalized geometry, uh, that's very closely related to double and exceptional field theory. And somehow the focus there is especially on the geometrization of the structure of gauge symmetries and how uh, backgrounds with fluxes in supergravity uh, can be encoded into the structure of the gauge symmetries of the supergravity itself, the global structure. Of these. Um, very good. So, what are these gauge symmetries? They're going to be different morphisms and gauge symmetries for my p folds. Okay, and we'll just go quickly through this kind of stuff. Uh, I think 15 minutes should be more than enough for that. Um, okay, so what do you do with double and exceptional field theory? Why would you even want to, to learn about this? Well, there are very good reasons. Uh, first of all, it's interesting that you can uh, write supergravity in a form that is covariant uh, under these groups. Uh, it's not obvious that you can do such a rearranging of the degrees of freedom. Uh, it may hint at something that goes beyond supergravity. Let's remember these groups show up in string theory after all, and they mix the states that are captured by supergravity with other ones. And you'll see a hint of that later 
uh, although it's, it's definitely a difficult line of research. Um, the other thing is there are more uh, concrete applications, which is solution generation. Uh, we'll get through that on Wednesday. I hope I'll manage to do all I've planned. So, you know, supergravity equations of motion are difficult. You might want to solve subsectors of these equations of motion, uh, find a solution there, and then lift it to the full theory. Double and exceptional field theory are very effective in describing this kind of reductions, this kind of truncations. Um, we will study a class of them, in a sense, the simplest one, um, which are called generalized Scherch force reductions where you take 11D or type 2D supergravity and truncate to a subsector, making some assumptions about the internal space. And the subsector is a lower dimensional maximum supergravity. You find a solution there and then lift it back. Uh, we'll come back to this on Wednesday. You don't have to remember this now. It's not already familiar to you. That's one use. There are many others. Uh, Dualizing brain solutions, you may construct brain solutions as solitonic solutions in supergravity. Uh, what happens when you try to apply U dualities to them and you want to study their, their, their orbits under U duality? Well, it's certainly convenient to write those solutions in a formalism that is already covariant under these groups. And that's where double and exceptional field theory show up. And I could go on. Um, this perhaps. Uh, a good idea to stress that there has been a recent review. I won't be giving, uh, actually, I apologize to the authors, but I think alphabetical order sometimes is difficult for me. Perman Blair review from a few months ago uh, on double and exceptional field theory. Uh, somehow the course I'm giving you is a small subset of what you'll find here. Uh, also regarding the details. And of course, there are many reviews about this subject. This is just the one that is more close to what I'm going to do. Um, now, the end point of these lectures is intended to be, if possible, uh, to use this framework I've just described to your generalized research for introductions uh, to get a uh, a uh, bird's eye view of a certain way to interpret not just this kind of dualities, but non-abelian dualities in target space. Uh, this has been a quite recent development um, in the field, and there is ongoing work. Uh, I won't be able to get into the details of that. I wouldn't even be the right person for it. Um, but luckily, in most cases, up to one technical assumption we'll get to on Wednesday, uh, the language, there is a language you can use to understand these non-abelian dualities in target space, and the language is the one of generalized structural reductions. So we will focus on that, and by the end of Wednesday, possibly in the last second exercise session, uh, I'll try to actually get to make contact with the idea of non-abelian dualities. I hope that's enough as a motivation and introduction. Uh, that's a good time to ask any questions. I found that it's very rare that asking for questions at this stage uh, or in this way really generates questions. But it's always worth, worth trying. And also remind you, you can interrupt, you can ask questions, don't worry about, uh, don't worry about interrupting. Okay, so we start from the very beginning now. The next thing I want to do for you is just review 11D, Type to be the bosons only. It's going to be very quick. Uh, if you're not familiar at all with this, uh, probably won't feel like you got enough. And how Kaluza Klein reductions give you some so called hidden symmetries. Um, 
And the reason for that is basically to give you the, the basic frame or the, ba the basic frame of mind for, for, the rest, for the rest of the lectures and also make sure that if anyone on the, on the audience uh, is uh, perhaps worked on something completely different than that, at least they can follow the rest of the course. So let's start with 11D. So what are the bosonic degrees of freedom of 11 dimensional supergravity? Well, we're gonna have a metric in 11 dimensions. I'll just put hats on the indices to represent their 11 dimensional of, we won't use that much. Uh, it's just to give it a name. And then a tree form, uh, which you may write with indices too. Um, and an action, which you find basically everywhere. I'll write this in form notation, hoping that I didn't mix up any conventions or coefficients. This is the action you get, usually. Uh, depending on conventions, you definitely may get different coefficients sometimes. Uh, some people may do some with scalings. Um, where F4 is rather obviously this field strength for the tree form. And then out of this, you immediately see there is a gauge symmetry for the tree form, which does not affect the metric. You may shift the tree form by an exact piece, and that, of course, doesn't show up in the fourth form. Um, on the other hand, F4 is really defined. Sorry. To be closed. And at this point, you might ask uh, is C3 globally a P form? Is this sensible in any manifold for any cohomology class? Well, the answer is well. The way I wrote it, it's probably not. You may ask, one might try to get into the details of what a tree, what this C tree needs to be for this expression to make sense globally on a non-trivial manifold. But I think I'll go to skip that. Um, that's a good question if you want to ask a question. Um, What I want to say about this is you may, so the first thing you might want to do is to solve the equations of motion for this. And that's how you find many well-known solutions like, I don't know, radius four crosses seven, uh, M2 or M5 bring solutions, um, waves, monopoles, and so on. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, right now, the only thing I want to write down is an equation of motion for the tree form because I'm gonna need it to make sense of something I need to write later. This is the equation of motion for the tree form. Notice uh, this is the Hodge operator. This allows me to define something called a dual form. Um, why would I want to do that? Well, because then this expression here which is clearly an equation of motion, looks like a Bianca identity for the dual form. Which means that I may write F7 in terms of an exact piece, sorry, because I'm missing zero here, and then a coupling to the tree form. So I hope this is clear to all of you. Um, you are very encouraged to ask questions if there's anything that, that, that confuses you here. Um, so why would I want to do that? Well, essentially because I want to be able to stress later on that P forms come in couples. They are dual to each other. There is this idea that given a form, you'll have a dual one. Um, and of course, this C6 here now has its own gauge symmetry. 
And you may check that it also needs to transform under the gauge symmetry of the tree form. Right, for F7 to be an invariant quantity. And F7 needs to be an invariant quantity because of its, its relation to the F4, which was invariant. Okay, so I think that's the shortest review of 11D sugar I can possibly do. We'll come back to it once we look at Kaluza crime reductions. I'll move to type 2B. Feel free to interrupt if you need anything. So what about type 2B? Now we are in 10 dimensions. We always have, well, let's not even write indices this time. We have a 10 dimensional metric. We have a dilatum and a Ramon Ramon zero form, which form an axidilatum. And I'll come back to this in a moment. We have a doublet of two forms, a four form, and then dual fields, which this time I'm not going to write. If you feel like it, you may take the equation of motion of P forms in type 2B and find the dual uh, potentials. Hopefully you'll believe that that's, you can do that. Um, so what about this axodilaton? You can parameterize the axodilaton in terms of a matrix. I think I'm using AB indices here. That's somehow the, 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 the precursor of everything we're going to do in this course. That's why it's useful to write it down even if it's very likely familiar to most of you. You can write a matrix, which if I'm not getting any coefficients wrong, looks like this. Let me just check to make sure I'm not getting confused. There are minus signs here. You may flip C0 to minus C0 anyway. Now this matrix has some nice properties. Uh, so the point of writing it like this is that you can write the action in terms of this M. Okay, so the axodilaton shows up in the action only in terms of this matrix here. You can also write it in this form. V A A dot V B B dot Delta A B both dot. This dot is some kind of flat index if you like. And V is e to the minus phi over two, e to the phi over two, C zero, e to the phi over two. And I believe there's a minus sign here again. So why does this matter? Well, because this is an element, you can easily check this is an element of, of a vessel too. And it's more than that. Uh, you can regard this as a Cosette representative for this space. There are two degrees of freedom here, right? SL2 is three-dimensional. You only have two degrees of freedom, phi and C0. So it turns out that if you take equivalence classes of SL2 elements up to a rotation, any such equivalence class contains an element of this form. So it's entirely parametrized. The space of equivalence classes is entirely parametrized by matrices of this form. And so the axiodilaton parametrized the Cosette space S2 over S2. Okay. Um, you'll hear about Cosette spaces in many places throughout this school. Uh, if you like, there is a naive introduction in the lecture notes in the appendix. So, what's the point of this? Well, the point of this is this S2 is a global symmetry of type 2B. You already noticed that. I had two forms sitting in a doublet with indices A, B, on which S2 acts rather obviously. C4 is a singlet instead. Uh, so let's write the action. Also, please do interrupt me if I'm scrolling away something you wanted to read or I'm moving to a new uh, board, let's say, um, and you still wanted to read something that was on the board. Even if you feel it doesn't apply now, it might apply later. So uh, let me make sure I get most of my coefficients right this time too. 
you will have an Einstein Hilbert term. I think I chose four notation, uh, one over four. You have a kinetic term for the scalar fields. Uh, you may complain about the sign, that's just because I'm writing in terms of n. Uh, if you write it about in terms of a scalar current, you get the correct sign and normalization. But you already see this thing is invariant under constant SL2 transformations acting on the indices A, B, because of course, constant transformation pass through the derivatives, plus or minus. Uh, you have field strengths for the two forms, which look like three forms, plus blah, blah, blah. Actually, I think I'm not gonna spend time writing this down. It's much easier for me to, it was supposed to be easier, to exploit technology. I'm pretty sure if I wrote it down by hand, it would have been faster. So you get this copy paste it from lecture notes, uh, more or less, you can find it in many other places too. You have a five form here, which is the field strength of the four form. You have a topological term. These two, these three pieces I had already written. Okay. Now the important thing is this is not an action. Um, meaning that uh, the degrees of freedom of the four form are actually halved because we need to impose a self-duality constraint on the five form. Um, the idea is there are ways to write actions for type to be, but something has to give. So I want to write an action which does not carry any uh, auxiliary fields and it is Lorentz invariant, then I can't do that. I'll write a pseudo action. So what that means is you first vary this pseudo action. You find the Euler Lagrange equations associated to this Lagrangian. But then those are not the actual equations of motion. You need to impose this, well, this self-duality constraint on top of them. And then you have the bosonic sector of type to be supergravity. OK? So out of this, one could play the game of looking at all the gauge symmetries of this theory associated with the p-forms, with the dual p-forms, convince yourself that dual p-forms transform under the gauge symmetries of the original ones in some kind of uh, hierarchical structure, just like C3 and C6, okay? That's the level of detail uh, you, you really need later. You won't need more than that, unless you want to write down all the little details of computations in mapping exceptional field theory to supergravity and vice versa, which we will happily not do during the course. But the basic idea has to be there. So having said all of this, uh, what have we learned so far? We have 11 dimensional supergravity, type to be supergravity. Uh, type to be has some SL2 global symmetry. We didn't discuss trombone symmetries. Uh, there's a rescaling symmetry even in 11 dimensional supergravity. Uh, there's an exercise in the notes that suggests to you to check that. And the same applies to type 2b. Uh, you're encouraged to try. It should be very short computation. Uh, forgetting about trombone symmetries, these SL2 in type 2b is what matters. At this point, let's try to look at Kaluza Klein reductions. Questions? Very good. So KK reductions on a torus. And we are not going to go through actually computing all the reduction of the equations of motion or of the actions, but let's get the basic idea. So especially what I want to see, first of all, are manifest symmetries and accounting of degrees of freedom. Well, really of field content, but let's say degrees of freedom. 
I'm trying to look at the image of you down there in, in the room, but it's impossible to see whether you are confused or bored or anything. So please do ask questions whenever you have one. That also helps me get some feedback of how things are going. Uh, so what's the basic idea of Kaluza Klein reductions? Uh, let's write it down in terms of coordinates, okay? So we have some 11 dimensional manifold. Well, let's first say we have some 11 dimensional manifold. And you want to write it in terms of some external manifold. I'm writing 11 for some reason. Let's say generic D. It might be 10 instead of 11. And factorize it into some external manifold, space time manifold, in an internal space like those. Let's just write TN. Okay. Uh, now, when you compactify on a torus, uh, you'll probably already seen what happens is you get a, a discrete spectrum of states corresponding to moment along the internal torus. So you can do some kind of Fourier expansion along the circles of the torus of all your fields. And the lowest state is massless. The other ones are massive when you look at them in terms of the, the equations of motion in the external space, or in, in terms of the the Poincare group makes some space, let's put it away. Um, so the truncation, Kaluza Klein truncations mean you just take the massless states and drop the Kaluza Klein tablets. In practice, what this means is we have we, our d-dimensional coordinates and we break them to some external coordinates and some internal coordinates, y n. Okay, that's that's what we're doing. And then, well. We have not done nothing. We just gave names to our coordinates. Kaluza Klein reduction means not independent bits. We drop the coordinate independence. You could, in principle, play the whole game of Kaluza Klein reduction without ever referring to a torus, just saying I drop all the coordinate independence. Physical interpretation, however, of dropping massive states uh, only holds if you're actually on a torus. Okay. If you do it in an uncompactified space, then you're dropping massless states instead. When you do, once you do this, you want to rearrange your fields in such a way that they look like fields of a d minus n dimensional gravity theory or supergravity. So if I take my initial metric, I write it as, what am I using here? A hat in terms of a field bank because it's easier to write down this way. And then I'll add the following. Using the fact that the torus is space-like and using Lorentz invariance in, in D dimensions, I can write this in a block triangular form. Let me just check my notation. There are going to be a field bank for the external space. The underlying index is flat. We won't use that much. Don't memorize the notation. It's basically never going to show up. There's going to be a field bank for the internal space. This time, I will use the underlined M for flat indices several times. And then there are a bunch of vectors. Uh, this way. Yes, that's correct. And this lambda here is the determinant of the internal metric to some power, um, which I often forget. Now, this coefficient here, this power here, shows up in many places in exceptional field theory, but I won't be stressing that entirely during the rest of the lectures. Uh, it just to make you see why that's the case would, would require a little bit too much work, but I encourage you to look back at the end of the lectures and ask yourself, why did that show up? in certain other places. Uh, you'll see what I mean, hopefully, in the second or third lecture. But anyway, the reason we write this down, uh, we put this coefficient here, is that I want this external field bind to be in the Einstein frame in d minus n dimensions. I don't think I mentioned why you want to stay in the Einstein frame, even in the lecture notes. So let me stress it now. The reason is these exceptional groups that show up as well, well hidden symmetries in maximum supergravities upon Kaluza-Klein reduction, 
they leave the Einstein frame metric inviolate. Okay, so the Einstein frame metric is a singlet. And that's why you want to sit in the Einstein frame. Things would be a little bit different for t-duality where it's more convenient to sit in the string frame and you'll see that later on. Okay, so that's easy. Uh, how do p-forms contribute to my lower dimensional theory? Here we already saw something, um, perhaps it's worth stressing. The lower dimensional theory is gonna have a metric. Yeah, well, that's not surprising. A bunch of vector fields, as many as the dimension of the internal torus. These are Kaluza Klein vector fields, and a bunch of scalar fields parameterizing the shape of the internal torus. Okay, and that would be the internal metric. Okay, so that's so far so good. What about the p forms? Well, first of all, you will need to take your p form, which has a bunch of mu1, mu hat, and indices. What that well, n is not a good p indices. What you should do to get uh, this thing to transform correctly when you do a dimensional reduction is you first dress these indices with your 10, when, when your d dimensional field bank, full one, so you flatten them. Okay, now they transform as scalars under coordinate transformations. And then because of the form of this, of this field bank that we picked, uh, I can then break them down into internal and external legs. So I could say I have a bunch of external indices and then a bunch of internal indices. Okay? Some number of these, some number of these. Okay? For simplicity, I don't want to use all these underlying flat indices all the time. I'll do the same counting you should be doing in this way. Uh, with the curved indices directly. Okay, the only difference you may easily guess is that some nonlinear definitions involving the of the diagonal block of the field bank are going to be involved, uh, going from flat to curved indices and back. Okay, so this is perfectly standard in supergravity, well, in Kaluza Klein theory. Um, what I was trying to do didn't work, just a second. There you go. So forget what I just said. Uh, the standard thing about Kaluza Klein that you have no linear definitions associated with Kaluza Klein vector, but I just want to do accounting. So I'll just do it with, with curved indices. My P forms will have a certain number of, I can divide into a certain number of external indices and a certain number of internal ones. So this object up to Kaluza Klein redefinitions is going to look like a Q form in external space time. And then it's going to carry a certain representation of the internal uh, group of reparameterizations of the tokens. In particular, We may look at scalar fields when all the legs are along, are along the internal space. Okay. Remember, these are all antisymmetrized. So, if the internal space is too small, is less than p-dimensional, then of course you don't get any scalars out of your people. So, why do I want to do this? Uh, because I want to discuss manifest symmetries along upon dimensional reduction, okay? And it's easier to see these when you look at scalar fields. So I don't want to look at the whole action and, and, and prove to you these symmetries. I want to convince you they are there and then hopefully you accept the rest. Uh, so how are we gonna do it? Well, it's easy to do the counting of how many scalar fields you get. I don't know, going from 11D to 7D. Uh, you're actually encouraged to do that. That's an exercise, I believe in the lecture notes. Um, but what matters now is what kind of symmetries do we gain, global symmetries, rigid symmetries after dimensional reduction? So first of all, let's remember nothing depends on the internal torus coordinates, right? But what were the symmetries of the initial theory? Well, the initial theory had coordinate reparameterization, 
changes of coordinates, and p from gauge transformations. Does any of that contribute to global symmetries after Palusa kind reduction? Well, the answer is yes. Imagine the following infinitesimal transformation of my internal coordinates. In general, such a transformation is parametrized by a vector along the internal space, an element or section of the quantum bundle. Uh, but I make I'm going to make a specific choice of this. I'll make it linear in coordinates with j constants. How do my fields transform under this? Well, through the lead derivative, right? This is a this is still a vector of psi, and fields any field phi transforms under such a vector with a standard lead derivative, right? So how, is a lead, how does a lead derivative look like? Well, it will have a transport term and then terms proportional to derivative of my psi acting this, this matrix here, you can think of as a GLD, well, GLN element, right? It's an N by N matrix, a generic one, as far as I know. Psi is arbitrary, so this is arbitrary. And then this acts on phi through the fact that phi is going to sit, as you may see from what we wrote up to now in the board, it sits in some G GLN uh, representation, right? The P forms transform in a GLN representation due to how many internal indices they have. And of course, something similar apply to, applies to the field bank in a nonlinear representation, if you like, because of the compensating Lorentz transformation on the flat index. Okay, very good. But now, if none, if none of my fields depend on Y, the first term disappears. And if my vector is of this form, then D psi is just J. Right, which is constant. So such a transformation, such a reparameterization of the internal torus does not introduce Y dependence on my fields. So it's a fine transformation to act, to use to act on my fields after causal kind reduction. And it looks like a global symmetry. It definitely doesn't doesn't depend on X by construction. So we certainly have some GLN global symmetry. Any other obvious symmetries we can get? Well, we can play the same game for p-forms. I'll scroll up, down a little bit more. Do interrupt me if you need to look back. Remember CP has a gauge symmetry associated to a P minus one form, D of P lambda P minus one. What if I play the same game for C M one and P equal to, look, let's keep the factors right. I hope you can read this. Right, that's just form notation, well, index notation for the same statement, but along the internal space only. So these are the scalars. You see why I was I was looking at scalars now, um, and it's the gauge transformations along the internal torus. What if this was constant, including the derivative after applying the derivative? So lambda is again linear in y coordinates. You apply one derivative, you get something constant, right? So these are constant shifts of my uh, p-forms or my scalars coming from p-forms. Or the scalars, 
okay? Now remember, these gauge symmetries are abelian for a single P4, but when you start having more than one, like C3 and C6, for instance, in 11 dimensions, then the higher ones transform under the P4 gauge transformations of the original ones, okay? So you start having actually um, hierarchical structure. And if you look at the algebra of all these kind of global symmetries you gain out of the P-forms, uh, in general, this is going to be a non-abelian algebra. And I think I chose to call these just It's hard to write by hand, let's say fracture P as an algebra, okay? This was easy, it was just GLN, is it right? I need to give a name to this and I don't want to commit uh, to describing details of it, just, just call it fracture P. You may look, for instance, at C3 and C6, um, reduced, I don't know, to five or four dimensions and look at the structure of this algebra of shifts. So is there anything else? Well, yeah, there was a trombone symmetry, which I glossed over. This is usually called R plus. I'm gonna put a zero here because I mean, that's the trombone symmetry before reduction, the one in 10 or 11 dimensions, let's say. This acts by a rescaling of your Einstein frame metric and of your P-forms usually just by the, I think always uh, by the P-form de uh, degree. Um, and then fermions, it also acts on fermions, that applies also to the solid fields. That's a global symmetry before reduction, it stays, log it stays a global symmetry. And finally, any global symmetry you already had. For instance, let me just call this G0. For instance, this will be SL2 for type 2B. So these are the symmetries you definitely get after Kaluza Klein production. Okay? The symmetries you already had, constant reparameterizations of your torus, and a bunch of shifts uh, of your internal P forms, those that look like scalars after reduction. Questions? Complaints? So, why are we doing this? Because now that we talked about manifest symmetries, I want to mention hidden ones. Before I do that, let me write the group version of this. So what we said we have here is we, the group of manifest symmetries is going to be some GLN. Then whatever original symmetries we had, And then this group of shifts of the P-forms, to which I'm just giving a name. Let me stress, if you only have one P-form, this is just, let's run form. This is just going to be an abelian group, like R to some power. And if you have more than one, it might be non-abelian. Now, let me leave that there. I haven't told you why I'm writing this this way. So let me stress this. The shifts of the P-forms only act on P-forms. The scalar fields coming from the field bind uh, are not affected, right? On the other hand, obviously under GLN, your P-forms transform, no? If you, I don't know, exchange two directions along the internal torus, that's gonna exchange two legs of your P-form. And so they also exchanges two legs of your constant shifts of P-forms. And so that's why you have a semi-direct product in the same way as translations are rotated by rotations in the Poincaré group. 
okay? That's what happens. And if your P-forms sits in non-trivial representation of some global symmetry group like SL2 in type 2B, then their shifts will also sit in such non-trivial representations. And so again, that's why I'm writing it this way. On the other hand, the parameterization of the torus and original global symmetries commute with each other. So that's what we have. But we know a little bit more. So this isn't just a group of global symmetries. This is the group you need to parameterize all your scalar fields. How is that the case? Well, you should probably already know that a field bind is an element of a coset. It's the quotient of GLN of the internal space by its orthogonal group subgroup. Right? When you choose a field bank, all you're doing is you're choosing a coset representative uh, in, this, in this space. And similarly, the axiodilaton we already discussed earlier uh, belongs to uh, a coset space, SL2 over SO2, where SO2 happens to be a maximal compact subgroup, which I'm calling generally just K of G0. Okay? So it turns out that the full scalar field space you get after dimensional reduction can be written in this way. Just with a little bit more of care, I'll write it like this. To keep in mind that I somehow need to remember that this stuff also acts on P when you do the quotient. And in fact, there was no scalar field associated with the trombone, so and there is some rescaling that does not correspond to any scalar. If you do the counting in what I wrote, you will see you get dimension plus one plus the number of scalars you would get by dimensional reduction. You actually need to quotient that. Away. That's a bit cumbersome. We'll mostly ignore this uh, when, whenever possible. And just to be precise, I need to put that there, otherwise you do the counting and it won't work, okay? So there is some linear combination of the center of GLN and of these are zero plus you need to remove because that doesn't correspond to a scalar field, just like the trombone symmetry in 11D does not mean that you have a scalar field in 11D, okay? And so you shouldn't count it, neither before nor after reduction. So this is the scalar manifold. Okay? Now the statement is that there are more symmetries than meets the eye here. And when you look at the full theory, and that's rather non-trivial uh, fact to prove. Uh, if you look, you may look at the Kramer and Julia paper showing B equal four maximal supergravity and showing there is only seven symmetry. That's not a trivial uh, work. Um, there is more than this. In fact, there are more symmetries. Remind, let me remind you something here. The P symmetries only act on the scalars coming from P forms. There are more symmetries which are somehow the transpose of this P and somehow mix P forms with the scalars coming from the metric, for instance. Okay. Once you do that, stuff like this becomes In the case of maximal supergravity, some exceptional group in the series I drew earlier, divided by its compact subgroup. Um, that's definitely non-trivial. Okay, um, you will have. To, I won't prove this. Um, something you do get, um, and I do discuss in the lecture notes, is uh, this thing here is of course a subgroup of EN. That's why this thing works. Branching EN with respect to GLN and G0, you can easily see a structure of pieces uh, where P is identified. So it's actually pretty easy to see how this subgroup, this, well, perhaps at the algebra level, the algebra of this, how it is embedded inside EN. Okay, just from the representation theory. Uh, but since I only have 30 minutes left, um, and at some point I was supposed to give you some break. Let me make sure I have nothing else to say right now and then we'll take that break. And actually, you know what? Yes, 
let's take a break right now. And what should it be? I'm not sure. A few minutes. Uh, whatever you prefer, a few minutes indeed. Okay. Thank you, Januka. <laughs> Feels a bit like I'm speaking to myself, so you know, ask questions, send complaints, do something. Maybe Gianluca. Yeah. Yeah. Um, only technical things. When you lean back, we can we hear you a bit lower. So when you uh. are far from the microphone, uh, so try not to do that. And uh, yeah, sometimes maybe it's difficult to to read your handwriting, but it's okay. If we couple it to the to the sound, yeah. My hope that. is my hope is that by saying what I'm writing, the yes, the, indeed, no, indeed, it's okay. Thank you. You tell me if it's too small, though. Like my handwriting is not suddenly going to become nice. But no, if it's I think uh, I think the size is okay. Also at the back of the room. Uh, we can we can see it. This is also a little bit of a review, so I feel like if you miss half a word on the board, that shouldn't hurt you too much. When we get to the meat, we try to be more brief, more a bit slower. I'm not checking Slack during the lectures. If anyone is writing there, please, uh, please write here instead. I think, uh, yeah, you can check it after the lecture. It's not necessary to, to keep an eye on it now. Is the dog from, uh, from you? Mm -hmm. We hear a dog. Is it coming from you? Yeah, it's coming from me. It's too warm to close the window. No, it's okay. Let me see. If, if it's too annoying, I will use the use this. Can you hear me? Yes, it's good. Okay. Okay. I am. Um, I think I'll keep going so that we can do a little, we can, we can get to the very start at least of double theory before the end of the lecture. So we got here and why did we get here at all? What was the point? Well, the point is I wanted to somehow to get you to, well, to get you to the point where you can cross check at least that it makes sense such exceptional groups in the series I drew earlier and that you find in a table in it actually show up. So what you could do now is look at the dimensionality of this space where you may have not derived P, but you can just count the number of scalars coming from a P form. Okay, that's all you need. And check it matches the dimensionality of this space. Okay. And then you may do something more. Uh, I'll give you an example in the notes. I think it's for SL5, but in general, you may branch the adjoint of EN with respect to GLN. Uh, well, plus G0, if, if you choose to do it for type 2D. And you'll get a bunch of representations. Somewhere in the middle, there's going to be GLN itself. And it should be easy to identify where P is by the dimensionality. OK? And somehow there's going to be hidden symmetries identified by the GLN gradient. One could be more technical and actually go through uh, uh, the composition of the exceptional group in terms of you know, some root diagram and then, yeah actually show how you construct this, but as long as you get the idea of how, why this works, uh, that's fine with me. 
So how do you parameterize these, these exceptional groups? Uh, just like we did for type 2b. We define some symmetric matrix. Now I'm going to use capital indices for it. Written in terms, whoops. I just realized I forgot to change notation in lecture notes. Let me note it down. So I can send you a revised version. In terms of a coset representative of this coset here, contracted with an invariant, just like you would do for an invariant of K of, in, of N, just like you would do to construct a metric, right? And indeed, this object here is usually called a generalized metric, or at least a unimodular generalized metric, because its determinant is one. Uh, there's something I'm not saying here, because I forgot. Uh, should also tell you what these indices are. So we'll get to that. So far, I only told you about scalar fields. Your reduced theory is going to have more than scalar fields and the metric. In particular, you'll get vector fields. Now we know there are vector fields coming from the higher dimensional metric. And of course, let me make a little bit of So we have vector fields from the metric, but then each P form you can decompose into an external indices and a bunch of internal ones. And you may just do the whole counting again and see the, these things sit into an ENN representation. And throughout the nodes, this is going to be called R1. And this R1 representation is this capital index M. You get an example in the nodes of such a representation. Uh, well, you get the whole table for these representations and then an example of how this decomposes for E7. Perhaps I should have picked a different example. But this, might be good. Nonetheless. There you go. The R1 representation for E7 is the 56, which is the fundamental. You break it down with respect to GL, N, and E7 you get these representations here. And they have an interpretation. So you may think of these vector fields as coupling to certain states. So imagine uh, doing the close ground reduction. You are, in this case, you go to a four dimensional theory. Now you look for particle like solitons there, half BPS ones. So preserving as much SUSY as possible. Um, then these are gonna couple to the vector fields. And depending on, which vector piece they couple to, they have a different interpretation in terms of the original 11D theory. Uh, some will come from momentum, some will come from M2 or M5 solutions compactified down to 4D, and some come from Kaluza time monopole states. And the way you identify which one comes from where is from, you know, Kaluza time momentum corresponds to states coupling to Kaluza time vectors. M2 and M5 couple come from the coupling, are those states that couple to the three and the six form in, in 11 dimensions. Kaluza Klein monopole is a little bit more uh, difficult to treat directly because you will need something dual to the Kaluza Klein vectors. So in 11 dimensions, that will be something dual to the metric. It's called the dual graviton. It's more complicated to treat. Um, and now you may see why we don't have E7 symmetry before reduction. If we want to, can we introduce degrees of freedom treating all these states, all these solitonic states and making them dynamic? Well, no, we cannot. The best we can do in supergravity is pick the momenta 
and plug them back into our theory by, by doing what? By reintroducing all the Kaluza Klein towers we dropped throughout the Kaluza Klein reduction. In doing so, the KK vector will couple to this internal momentum, but the vector fields associated to P forms are not allowed to couple to M2 or M5 states because those don't belong to supergravity. And as a result, you broke his seven invariants by oxidizing to eleven. Okay. I hope I hammered this point enough. Um, this was probably the right time to stop, but since I stopped early, I'll just move directly to the uh, last part of this first lecture. Or if you like, it should be the beginning of the second one. But perhaps a better idea to start immediately. Okay. Oh, one last thing. Uh, you could write actions for the Kaluza Klein reduced theory, and then you will see that everything is invariant under these exceptional groups. I wrote these in the lecture notes uh, for, I, I don't think we need to go through it right now. Um, perhaps when we go through XFT dynamics, I'll come back to it. I'm going to move to a new board, um, and try to get to the beginning of ODD and our free theory. That's a very good time to ask any questions on this first part. We have a question in the room. Oh. Okay, uh, nice. Thank you. Hi. Um, I just had a question about this uh, coset uh, E. Yeah. E and then. Um, does this matching in terms of degrees of freedom counting also work when n is bigger than eight? Very good question. Uh, no, that's actually one of the questions in one of the exercises where perhaps I should have also suggested the solution, but I didn't. So the counting works directly up to n equal to seven. Uh, for n equal eight, so for E8, that's a three-dimensional theory. If you just count the number of degrees of freedom that you should get from 11 dimensions going down to three, but you don't ask them yourself where those degrees of freedom should sit, whether it's in scalars or one forms or something else, then the counting works. Uh, but if you try to match, like you ask yourself, well, this degree of freedom comes from the metric in 11B, this other from the three form and so on, you see that there's something weird going on. Um, the reason is, uh, some degrees of freedom come from Kaluza Klein vectors, the K mu M I was writing down. Um, those go down to three dimensions. You will need to dualize those into scalars to see the full E8. Now in three dimensions, you can dualize a, a vector field per scalar. The interpretation in 11 dimensions before reduction will be that you again dualize a piece of the graviton into a dual graviton. But that's a nasty thing to try to do. Uh, basically, I don't think there is a full nonlinear expression for that before reduction, okay? Without dropping any color, without dropping those time troubles. When you go to E9, it's even worse. You have infinitely many scalars. Only a finite number of them is physical. The rest of them are dual to the physical ones. And you're going to get lectures, I think, on the principal chiral model. Uh, the structure is similar to what you see there in that non gravitational case. Okay, so there is, in fact, classical integrability of 2D supergravity equations. You may write, so this infinite set of scalar fields and their duality relations somehow reflect the fact that you can write everything in terms of a lax pair. Okay. You go down to E10 or E11, um, things get even more nasty because there are more exotic dualities relating the degrees of freedom. That does it answer the question? Any other question? Okay. Okay. So let's forget about Kaluza Klein reductions. We move to something simpler. Let's think of uh, 
Nova Schwarz, Nova Schwarz sector. Oh. To be Sugra, but this is really the prototype. And well, how did I write this down? Oh gosh. Um, I definitely need to fix the action I wrote in the notes. Let me write this this way before we make things worse. I mixed form and index notation in the notes. That's rather horrible. Um, I think that works, yeah. So let's consider the Nova Schwarz, Nova Schwarz sector of the string, just a dilaton, a metric, and a two form B2, subject to the obvious. Uh, gauge symmetry. In Eric's lectures, this is going to be called zeta, I believe. I don't think that's going to cause any confusion. But now that we get closer to double field theory, this will work also as an introduction for some of the concepts you need in Eric's lectures. The notation is not always the same. Um, there are some warnings in the notes. And if there is any confusion, please do uh, uh, contact us on Slack. Okay, so just to make sure you can map what I say to what he says and vice versa. Um, okay, what should we do with this? The idea is the following. So this could very well be, if you just change the dimension, the bosonic string, uh, massless sector, right? Uh, the idea is the following. Uh, this action is not invariant under T dualities. But we know that the string on a background parameterized by these the, by background fields of this kind enjoys a t-duality uh, on a torus, of course. Let's say a d-dimensional torus. There is an ODDZ t-duality associated with pre-parameterizations of the torus, exchanging of momentum and winding. That's really the most non-trivial part, and shifts of the b-field, okay, of the background b-field. What I want to do now is just forget about the physics and just rewrite the field content in a form that is uh, covariant under O10, ten. I'm going to just stick to 10 dimensions to make everything simpler to write. Uh, and after that, we'll try to get back to the point of what's the physical interpretation of what we just did. OK, so before we do that, just a few things about what is ODD for generic D first. So ODD is defined by having uh, some represent the, the vector representation, which I'm going to call R1 again. It somehow plays the same role of what we were discussing with the line. That's the re vector representation. So it's 2D dimensional. In this representation, we have an invariant, E time n, which is symmetric. And it is just given by delta mu nu, delta mu nu where the idea here is that if you have an element of R1, you can decompose it into V mu, V mu. Okay? I'm not putting hats anymore here. Uh, this is supposed to be before any dimensional reduction. But in the DFT case, we won't really need dimensional reduction. You may ask why, uh, if that's not clear to you. Um, Okay, so in this decomposition of R1, we can write the invariant. I choose to write it in this light cone form. And then my generators, TMN, are those that preserve this invariant. These are the generators, so that's the algebra, SODD, SODD. Okay? That's easy. Let me do something more because I'll need it later. I'll just write this down in a block, a few blocks. A menu. Minus A menu. Is there a question? Uh, no, Gianluca, you have 10 minutes left. Yeah, okay, good. 
where B and C are anti-symmetric. Okay, so that's how you can decompose into blocks these generators of SO and CoN, SO D, D. And you recognize some subalgebras which exponentiate with subgroups of ODD. Only A, that gives you a GLD. Only B, that gives you R to the D times D minus one over two, just the number of entries in B, anti-symmetric. Okay, that's an abelian algebra. And in fact, the same applies to well, or only C. Okay. But let me focus on A and B. By exponentiation, this becomes semi direct product of GLD times R to the, this, this, this number here. Okay. You'll probably see how this is analogous to what we had yeah, for these shifts of P forms um, in terms of line reduction. Okay. So let's actually go back to our action. Our Theory here had uh, yeah. Let me make something here. I think all you really need, I'm, I'm sure, ODD is clear to you. Uh, just this parameterization of the generators. So I'm just going to postulate a generalized metric in a way similar to, which is somehow analogous to what we had in in this Kaluza time reduction story. Uh, where I was writing this curly M coming from uh, the scalar fields upon dimensional reduction. This time there is no dimensional reduction, just pick all the fields I have without reduction, without uh, breaking them into pieces. Okay. And then you can write a generalized metric. And let me make sure I don't get uh, indices wrong. New row B, new sigma. G was sigma, uh, are the signs right here? B nu rho, G rho nu, minus G nu rho, B rho nu. This is a symmetric matrix. If one of these two signs is wrong, please check that. Should be right. For us to check, I don't make silly mistakes. Uh, I'm just postulating this, but there is a reason why I postulate it this way. Um, look at what I have here. I have an A mu nu and a B mu nu as generators of SOD, D, and B mu nu are anti-symmetric, and A mu nu parameterizes GLD, right? So it turns out that I could write this H here as some Cosette representative. times an invariant under what's going to be the denominator. And we'll get to that in a moment. With V, exactly what you would expect. The field bind for G. Uh, what did I use here? Well, I'll, I'll move to the notation that I think Eric also uses. I use a little a. Don't confuse it with SL2. Um, hope I'm getting this right. Yeah, that should be correct. And and e. e well, let's see. E, e, the inverse field line. Okay, just check this expression contracted with a delta you see in a moment, but you can easily guess gives you back this matrix. Okay, and this expression is obviously an element of this group 
of GLD and P from shifts, right? So what's going on here? Let's make this clearer. So, and I'll need a little bit space. So let me just give the parameterization. So first of all, Delta is an invariant under SO1,9 squared, which is a subgroup of SO10,10. So here I'm gonna have the Minkowski metric in 10 dimensions and it's inverse, right? Then you may check that you, out of V, you get this H. And this is a parameterization of the following cosset space. Again, you could take a, take a different dimensionality. Okay, this is what V is. And so H parametrizes in a way that is invariant under the denominator group. Uh, it parameterizes this space. It contains all the information about the points on this space. And rather obviously, it transforms covariantly under SO10,10. Now, the important point, and I think I'll stop there, is that, uh, well, first, maybe let me say, there's something else you could have used to define, just point out H, H and P, H and Q, eta PQ is equal to eta M. Okay, so that's also true. Okay, and somehow characterizes H. This and the fact that it's symmetric, non-degenerate, determinant one, and its signature make it a uh, uh, parameterization of this cosset space. So why does this matter? Well, because now we can do, we can parameterize T duality acting on H. In particular, the important point is the following. I, and then I'll stop. Let me copy this. So that I have it here. Now suppose I take, um, Suppose I take my mu index and break it down into a, just to keep it same, i and nine, okay? That's 10 entries, i starts from zero, okay? Then I write a matrix O, which is an element of of, S, of O 10, 10, with these entries here of diagonal. So I'm exchanging uh, the last entry of the upper block with the last entry of the, under, the, of the lower block. That's T duality. If you think of this acting on a set of bosons and their, and their binding duals on the, on, on, on the worksheet, that's how you would parameterize T duality. Importantly, if you now compute H prime equal O, H O, and then you decompose H prime into a G prime and a B prime, reproduce Boucher rules. And since we are out of time, I'll assume you're already familiar with that or you just look it up in the lecture notes or in a textbook. And I hope that's okay. So I'll steal half a minute just to stress what's going on here. All I did is take a bunch of fields in a 10 dimensional theory, plug them into something I'm calling H, noticing that I could do that. They somehow parameterized exactly what I needed for this cosset space here to, sorry, okay, for this cosset space to be parameterized by these fields. And in this way, I got something that looks like it's O10, 10 covariant. That doesn't mean my theory has such a symmetry. It just means I have a nice, nice action of O10, 10 on this field. 
Now, what's going to happen is that at some point I need to couple these feeds to derivatives, and there autoencoma ten is going to be broken. But if we think of a situation where I don't have derivatives, perhaps under conjugate line reduction, then at least a piece of this autoencoma ten is going to be a symmetry, and hence a piece of this structure we just saw will reproduce T duality. Okay, but right now we are still missing the the, the point of how how the dynamics are invariant or, or not and under this old time from time. Okay, we are just noticing that the group structure is such that we can algebraically reproduce the Boucher rules uh, if we do ignore uh, all the derivatives in our theory. I think I'll stop here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, very well. Thank, thanks a lot for this first lecture. I'm not sure you will, you will be able to hear it, but I want to ask everybody to give a round of applause to Gianluca. So in view of time, I would uh, suggest to move uh, any question to, to Slack. We will be back at o'clock which for people following the Central European time zone means 12 o'clock. Um, so we will now have a coffee break. The coffee break will be in the garden of the classroom that you found when you entered the, the, the hotel. Because of COVID restrictions, we have to be sitting down. We cannot uh, stand up. Uh, other practical things, uh, the, the room will remain always open. The idea is that you can stay in the room to work uh, at any time uh, so it will never be locked also during the break so if there are some valuables that uh, you want to keep safe you just ask at the reception uh, that is here in the corridor uh, and they will store them for you either at the reception or in the storage room uh, toilets mm, there's a bar in front of the reception and there are toilets there there are more toilets close to the exit of the, um, uh, of the hotel, which is more convenient for, uh, for the coffee break now. And I think uh, this is it for the moment. So see you at o'clock.